He says, I work for him and, I, and he has to do his job, you know? <laughs> so he sort of thought, well, okay, that sounds reasonable enough. So he, to him it was, it was no problem because he believed that God was there, that he would help him. He was in a dilemma and he expected it from him and it happened. And so I was there right in the middle of this incredible story. I mean, I, I don't know how many lawyers there must be in Australia or New South Wales, but how coincidental I get one bloke turning up one day, then the other one the next day, both in front of me, and this thing happens. But it made me think, you know, um, when you pray, does God listen to your prayers? Does he act in this way? Is he an interventionist God? You know, it's hard enough for people to believe that there's a God, let alone that he can step in and do things for you, and this is what seemed to be happening. So I thought, well, I'll have a look and try and study this scientifically. Is this coincidence, miracle? How do people explain miracles? Do they really happen? And if they really do happen, how can there be atheists around if this really happens? Why this divide? So I began researching the famous miracle of Fatima in, in Portugal in 1917, and to me that was an incredible story. It still is. It's, it's hard to believe that something so momentous could have happened with so many witnesses, obviously a sign from God. No one ever talks about it, and yet it had to do with finding peace on earth. I then began to read the lives of the saints, and um, I, then I realised that in the lives of the saints, the sort of thing that I'd experienced with this priest were almost commonplace. Read the story of the Curé of Ars, read the story of Padre Pio. In fact, Padre Pio became a very good um, subject for me, my reading, because I couldn't believe that there existed a person in 1968 who had such obvious signs that God was acting through him. You know, I'd never heard of the stigmata before, that it was a real event, a real thing. And also began to read some of the, the writings of mystics, like um, St. Catherine of Siena. And I thought, this is unusual. Why don't people ever talk about this? That the church actually recognises that God can speak to a human being and impart to them information which for the good of humanity. This is after the time of the apostles. And the work that they receive in dictation from Jesus becomes part of the literature of the church and they get marked as doctors of the church. To me that seemed uh, an in incredible story and I thought to myself, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it have been nice to have actually lived at the time of Catherine of Siena, to have been in the room when Jesus was speaking to her, that you could examine her, that you could, you know, form your own opinion rather than relying upon what's given to you historically. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I actually had those, have had those opportunities. They're remarkable. Many of them have documented. Some of them are, I actually record in the book Reason to Believe. And I haven't got time. I know there's a time creep around here somewhere going to watch my time, so I've got to be careful about getting the important things down. But these stories were real. And, and, and it was this type of subject matter that I was speaking to Mike Willisy about. Mike was um, a neighbour of mine, a um, friend, I was also his lawyer, and I discussed some of these stories that I'd been examining, like the stigmata, and he said, and he said, look, Ron, he said, I've done stories like this over the years. There's no such thing as a miracle. They're all hoaxes. And I said, well, I said, you are a journalist who prides in the fact that you make pronouncements about what you believe based upon an examination of evidence. But here you're making a pronouncement of negativity about the story of the stigmata without looking at the evidence. How many other stories have you done like this? You know? <laughs> and so I said, why don't you go and prove me wrong? So he was an ex-Catholic, very hostile against the church. But he took up the challenge because um, he had in his essence that true journalism, which is to say, okay, this, a lot of consequences follow if this story is true. A lot of consequences follow if it's false. Either way, it's a great story. And so he took up the challenge. And so, and when a friend of his in the Fox Network, who actually grew up with him in early television, heard that he was going to uh, do a story on this claim that I had believed in, that there was a current person who was experiencing the stigmata, they said to Mike, would you be prepared to film what you investigate? And he thought it was a great idea. So we then lined up a, a time to go and meet a person I'd been studying. And, um, and she had had the experience of the stigmata a few times, and usually on a Friday. So we thought, well, let's go over there Good Friday, which is um, 
uh, you know, the time when Jesus died on the cross, maybe if he's going to have the stigmata, it'll happen on that day. So we get there with film crews from America and we get there and um, we start to question her. She says, yes, I'm happy to be filmed when I have it, but I, uh, I don't know whether I'm going to have it today. And then Jesus apparently speaks to her and said, Jesus says to me, I won't have the stigmata today, but I'll have it on the day after the Feast of Corpus Christi, which was two months away. That was very interesting. I know that people might say, oh, why would, if God was talking, why would he send you all the way back to Australia and then make you come back again, all that cost? But it was a very interesting technique or ploy that was being used because what we were able to do is actually film the prediction of an event. If it happened, that would be an amazing historical fact that you could film someone predicting a supernatural event in advance. So we filmed the prediction. The prediction essentially was that two months' time, the day after the Feast of Corpus Christi, that she would have the stigmata. It would start around about 12. She would go through the experience of the pain and suffering of Christ in her hands and her feet. And then at three, it would subside. The next day, it would be gone. That was the prediction. So when the Fox Network heard that this was on the go, she said, well, we've got a great story here because if this doesn't happen on that day, we've got a, a fraud. So it was a big thing hanging on that. So we come back on the day after the Feast of Corpus Christi, in fact, the day before, two cameras, seven witnesses in a room. And um, let's see if I can play this thing now. Tell me if I'm doing it right. Is there something coming up? No? What do I have to, to do to get this thing to work now? Uh, okay. Okay. <clears throat> well, there you see the um, scene from the program. But we go there on the day, and um, we were there before 12 with two cameras, nine witnesses. And the cameramen, the people, got no belief in God, or they're just doing a duty. They're from 60 minutes. Um, and uh, so we are watching. She, at 12, around about 12-ish, wounds start appearing on the head as if from the crown of thorns. Um, they're the first ones. They just started to appear in front of us. Ultimately, subsequently, when we had a, um, an expert pathologist look at them who would, and we told him no um, explanation as to what they were, he said, those injuries look like thorn marks or uh, marks that you'd get if a person had fallen out of a car into bushes because you see the perforations into the skin from tiny plant particles. He says, that's the, that's the impression I get from looking at that. So there those appear in front of us. Then progressively, you can see there, there's nothing, and the times are on the top there, 12, 26, 38 seconds. You just see the, the beginnings of something. And then it begins to appear progressively. And you can see it's like a form of a cross that was there. That appeared by itself. And then ultimately, the wounds became larger. Um, and deep. You can see there that, that footmark. In fact, when that was being filmed, you could actually see the blood oozing out of the skin, and the perforation was almost in a perfect circle, as if, and you could almost measure the diameter of that circle. But those wounds formed in, in harmony with each other, both feet the same time, same intensity, and the undersides of the feet, the same with the hands. People, people, many people have gone to print after seeing this program and commented about it. Oh, and they said, look, it's mind over matter. She did it to herself. Well, we take the argument she did it to herself. How could she fool ten witnesses and two cameras that she did it to herself without anything in her hands? How could she do it in all those places? Something happens. The explanation is not that she did it to herself. Some people say, well, you know, maybe the, 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 the power of mind over matter. In the literature, you'll find that there are some instances where, under hypnosis, some people have been able to create marks on their body. But there's no information in any literature that I've been able to find where someone who is not under hypnosis can predict in advance that they can make appear in their body wounds which um, mimic the wounds of Christ for them to appear from nothing, for them to form harmoniously, 
for them to progress and then ultimately to subside within a time span between 12 and 3. That is unique. If anyone anywhere in the world can produce a person who can make that prediction and make that happen, we'll be the first on a plane to go and find it and, and uh, examine it. But we are witnesses to this incredible story. It actually happened. The explanations of self-manipulation, the explanations of, of, um, of uh, hypnosis just aren't the answers. And yet what we say, 30, 40 million people have seen this film, not one critic has rung us up and said, can we speak to any of the witnesses? Can we see any of the raw footage? And I suppose the reason why I feel this is the sort of thing that should be ventilated and discussed is because often there are stories that do happen in our history that prejudice prevents a full knowledge and understanding of what's happened. Because if there was a genuine concern 